There we go. All right, hey everybody, welcome to the Frankie Slauson Show, and uh, as we celebrate, as or I should say, as we continue the series, Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture. Uh, today I have my third guest of this summer, uh, which actually would be my twenty-fifth guest total of uh, the year two thousand thirteen so far. Uh, I have a, a person who I think would describe uh, uh, what an icon of pop culture w- would be, even if you've never heard of this guy. I'm gonna have him explain why he why he would believe that he would be fit into uh, to become a, a, a icon of pop culture. He is a horror actor in the in the horror genre. Uh, his name is Parrish Randall, and uh, welcome to the show. Hey man, uh, Sean, I'm I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Hey, no problem. And uh, well, kind of describe yourself. Like, uh, what would make you an icon of pop culture? <laughs> well, I've got to say, I've got to say, I yeah, I don't think of myself as an icon of anything. So, <laughs> first of all, but I appreciate you having me on the show. And uh, literally, what uh, what I do is, uh, you know, I'm an actor. I uh, I've appeared in uh, a number of of horror films that fall into the I would say B range category. I live in a few maybe C range, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know, I love doing what I do and. Uh, very thankful and feel very blessed to get to call it my job. Uh, I've done, I think, uh, eight films to date and uh, booked to do three more back to back. So, you know, the work continues to carry me thanks to the folks up there who uh, who support the work, you know. Um, and again, you know, the film that, uh, that I find myself cast in are generally those films like Jacob. Uh, with, uh, Jacob is a, is a slasher type film, it's a throwback to the 80s style flasher flicks and uh, it's getting some really great if you will uh, uh, support now it uh, just hit DVD and Blu-ray uh, uh-huh. from Horizon uh, video uh, and so essentially that's what I do I've always been a film buff always loved film since I was a, a six year old kid uh, up down 11 I had a super millimeter camera and projector you know I'm out in the backyard sure you know, making horror films, casting my friends. All the kids are playing out of whatever. I was making horror films, <laughs> splattering my parents' backyard with uh, stage blood, and uh, I'd raid my mom's refrigerator, and if she had any, you know, as bad as it sounds, you know, uh, liver, chicken innards, <laughs> anything I could, you know, just fill in the mix to make it look gory. Sure. You know, hey, I was trying to emulate George Romero and uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis and all those guys back in the day, right? And, sure. uh, so essentially, yeah, that that's that's my gig. That's what I do. Uh, I love acting. I love film. So have you and ever I've always loved the horror genre? Okay. Well, when we talk about, uh, or when you talk about uh, doing the Super Eight millimeter films, did you ever watch that movie Super Eight that came out last year? I did. I did. I did. You know, and it, it was really neat to watch it because it was. I could identify with it. You know, I mean, uh, I'm I'm a bit older in years than a lot of the. Uh, young cats that I work for, you know, so, so many of these films now are shot on digital, and I'm, I'm thankful for that, because thanks to the digital revolution, uh, man, a lot, a lot of actors like myself have been given the opportunity to work and, and, and build careers um, within the direct-to-DVD market, or blue right now, uh, but uh, watching that film Super 8, you know, um, the kids running amok, you know, their shots, and, uh, running into all the chaos and such that comes along with when you're really shooting on film, even, you know, albeit Super 8 millimeter film, it was cool. I could relate to that because I went through that, you know. Um, when you're a kid trying to make a movie and actually you're shooting it on film, you, you, you have to worry about lighting. You have to worry about all these things that, you know, I don't know, you have to worry about it with digital, but, you know, not as, it's not as uh, harrowing. Sure, <laughs> You know sure. what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, and, and and that's that's kind of cool because uh, it's always interesting to talk to who uh, got to ch- a chance to work with Super Eight uh, 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 millimeter film because I I never got into that when I was a kid because I'm only 29 years old so I was I was born in the 80s and everything and, and and my my life I guess I never I mean I got into like the video cameras and stuff like that but I never never got a chance to work with Super Eight millimeter film so uh, I'm sure it's a lot different. Then the video camera, like what you would use even today, obviously. But even when talking back to like the the, the big cameras that uh, that you'd see uh, news reporters have, or, or like uh, paparazzi have, or whatever. 
Right, right. I mean, those days, I mean, uh, the news news cams, you know, uh, they they shot directly on, um, I believe they shot on Super 16 millimeter, okay, which was an enhanced variation on 16 size film. That was Super 8 millimeter, and, you know, you shot the footage, and you had to take it and develop the footage and edit the footage. And, I mean, when I say edit, I don't mean utilizing a computer software program, you had to edit with an old, you know, flatbed, which literally you would cut the film frame, you know, frame by frame. You'd say, well, I want to use, you know, uh, these 18 frames, cut two frames, go to the next, that sort of thing, sure. uh, which required, again, additional equipment like the old reel-to-reel that you could actually watch on this little bitty screen in the center of the reels. You could you'd crank it by hand, and you'd be able to actually, you know, uh, see frame by frame, you know, what was on your clock so that you could then cut and edit. And it, it was something that, you know, literally, uh, I'm glad that, I'm glad I came up during that era because uh, editing on Super 8 was, it was the same. Pr- sure. Actual 35 millimeter film, like, you know, man, I, yeah, back in the day, you, you watch the old films, uh, uh, the old documentaries about, you know, Hitchcock or those guys, William Castle, so many of the uh, the filmmakers, the directors that would go in the room. You know, Hitchcock had Alma, his wife. She was an editor in the 21st Meter. And, of course, her editing editing style was very much part of all of his films, uh, onward and through. And most prevalently, I think, you know, you see it uh, in Psycho. Uh, uh-huh. Alma took Psycho and recut it and made it the film that we all know today. Uh, but... Uh, you see them with the reel to reels and their cutting and such and so it's, it's super eight millimeter editing was the very same principle. You were just dealing with much smaller film. Oh sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And but in a way I kinda like the digital age. I mean I got like okay, like on my YouTube channel I do I've done a well over five hundred different videos, you know, other than just the interviews that I do now. I've done over like five hundred type of videos that are just video video. Then I do I have editing software and stuff like that and, and the thing that I like most is is that uh, editing stuff, especially when I use Sony Vegas and stuff for my software, it's so easy. I mean I don't do a lot of fancy editing like like you would see like other YouTubers do, but I mean it, it does give me that option if I want to. So uh, it, I don't know, it's it's kinda neat to be able to do that from your own home. Oh, I think so. I mean I'm a big, big, if you will, proponent and supporter and I you know, of, of the digital age. Uh, it simplified so many, so many facets of what is film production. Okay, sure. And it's also enabled so many people, good, talented artists, filmmakers across the country, you know, to go out and actually make their movies. Uh, whereas used to, let's face it, you know, you would uh, generally have to, unless you were there. You know, there were those rare filmmakers that, like Romero with Night of the Living Dead in '68, and you know, Toby Hooper and Marilyn Burns and that, that, those folks that made Chainsaw Massacre in Texas in 74. You know, there were those films that were made outside the Hollywood system, but for the most part, if you wanted to make movies, well, you had to go to the West Coast. You had to then lobby for, work for, and hope that you could amass enough of a budget to make a movie. And understand, even a low-budget movie shot on well, film, like, like Night of the Living Dead, you know, there's varying reports on what their budget was, but at the very least, you know, I've heard the lowest I've heard is 168000 So, you know, that was back in 1968, shooting on black light. Oh, film sure. Yeah. And back, and back in those <laughs> days. Pretty much, yeah. yeah, so it was a pretty prohibited time, specific to, you know, a lot of good, talented artists being able to make their films, because not everybody was able to raise that kind of cash, obviously. Yeah. Uh, whereas now, with the digital age, you've got a lot more flexibility, you know, uh, monetarily speaking, you know. Th- good films now can be made for, well, you know, again, it depends on the filmmaker behind behind the, behind the lens, obviously, you know. If you've got a good director, if you've got a good DP and team, good lighting team, the whole nine yards, and a budget of you know, let's face it, a hundred thousand. A good film can be made. Uh-huh. You know, uh, well, hell for that matter. I'll be honest. I mean, I've seen some films made for fifty thousand. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, 
talking about these pretty damn good little movies because the people behind the cameras, the technical team, the director, they all had studied for years in some form or facet filmmaking. And yeah. they were artists, and they, they knew what they wanted, and they had the eye for it. And they were able to make and execute their films, you know, uh, because it no longer costs so, why, so much. So why why do you think the making a movie costs a lot like it does? Mm. What, when you're shooting on digital, well, uh, it, you mean? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. If you're making a movie... Like say you're Steven Spielberg and you're doing a cl- another oh, classic. Wow. <laughs> why why does it cost so much money to make a blockbuster? You know, you know honestly, I mean, I, I've had so many discussions about this with a lot of friends of mine. I, you know, I have some friends who live in Los Angeles and some of whom have worked in some of those larger productions. And you know, uh, you know, I, I will tell you the reason those films that are considered studio films run 80 million or 40 million or 50 million uh, in my opinion it's simply because in California everybody wants a piece of the pie yeah. you know uh, let's face it I mean locations are going to run you out the wazoo your technical teams your actors and actresses those those A-list names okay yeah. <laughs> Come on, you know, they're going to command salaries that are just exorbitant as hell, okay? <laughs> and now that has changed because because there's so many there's so many independent features, you know, filling the market now. A lot of the studios, like Lionsgate, we're seeing them release more and more indie features because they're, they're grabbing up the indie films that are well done for a couple of hundred thousand or maybe even a million or less, half a million. Uh, they're grabbing those up and releasing those because, you know, listen, less money invested, then let, it's easier to make a profit. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So that's a good thing yeah. because that means a lot of independent things are getting widespread release. Uh, so the dynamic within what is that Hollywood system, they shifted a whole lot because of the independent film revolution and because of comics. Not as many $80 million features are being made. Uh, there was a time when, you know, I was a kid, man. It's like, shit, there were, I don't know, you know, dozens and dozens of big budget blockbusters released, you know, every year. And uh, we started to see the film industry sort of, you know, suffer economically by the mid to late 90s. I don't know if you can recall that era, you know. Yeah. Were losing money. I, you know, I guess uh, back in those days when I was a kid, I never really paid much attention to that. I just, if a movie was good, I I go see it, and if it wasn't, I I guess I right, didn't really right. care at the time. <laughs> right. Well, it came to this point where you know a lot of the studios recognized of the late nineties that uh, you know they weren't really recouping the cost of their films until their films went through that theatrical run and hit what was at that time VHS. Okay, uh-huh. they were actually recouping and making the profits for the most part on home video. So that certainly, you know, sort of become something that Hollywood looked at more closely. And then, of course, in 2000, you had the Blair Witch Project thing happen. Okay, and I'm not a big fan of the Blair Witch movie. I mean, it 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 was what it was. Uh, my wife and I went to see it, and she was seasick in the theater. Right? <laughs> 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 You know, it was innovative, and that opened the eye to to the big studios. That was the first film that man they said, "Hey, this thing was made for you know a few bucks, and it went on to gross three hundred million." And so there there came that point where hey, they started to look towards less costly features. Then by oh five and oh six, man, you just had this digital explosion. The technology had advanced to the point at which films could be shot on digital. And they had a close enough look to film that in many cases, as long as they were, you know, utilizing good equipment, shooting through a 35 millimeter lens, audiences really couldn't tell that much of a difference, if any at all, you know, between those shot on film and those shot on on the better digital. And uh, the first film I did, well, I started out, you know, literally, again, I I took really seriously the whole craft that is acting. Uh, I'd grown up watching Cagney and Stewart and Bogey and all those people. Oh, and, yeah. Man, you know, I, I knew this is what, you know, I wanted to do. But I put all of it to the side for many years because I listened to people who said, you can't do that. 
Oh, geez. And uh, I was married my high school sweetheart. We're still married. Uh-huh. Twenty, almost twenty-eight years later. Wow. And uh, but bottom line, you know, finally in about, I guess it was nineteen ninety-nine. I was sort of, I realized this thing, this compulsion to go after some sort of career in film, it wasn't going to go away. It was just wow. It was kind of like artistic drive, you know, uh-huh. that I had, and I wanted to do it. So I worked my day job and started. I remember doing some acting classes. I wanted to you know, learn techniques and things that worked for me. And and I met Chuck Norris you know, <laughs> through through a mutual acquaintance and uh, ended up getting some bit parts on the old Walker, Texas Ranger show okay. during its final season. And uh, and then, I, you know, from, that, from 2000 to 05, that's, I did bit parts and met so many good people and learned from their stories. And Joe Don Baker as well, who played Buford Pusser in the original Walking Tall, he had gone to school with my dad. Oh. Go down hills from in my hometown in Texas. I hail from, and Joe Don. He provided me with a lot of guidance, a lot of support. Not support is in the form of no monetary support, and he didn't go out and get any roles. But he gave me, I don't know, encouragement, guidance. He helped me avoid some pitfalls of the industry, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, in in '06, I ended up landing the lead bad guy role in this film, The Quick and the Undead, which was a merging of the zombie genre with the Sergio Leone spaghetti western kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm playing this lead bad guy, and, you know, it's the first principal role I had, and I'm not going to lie to you, man. They flew me out to L.A., and the first day I'm set up, it was, yeah, I don't know if I can say that on your show, I'm sorry, I cussed. Oh, that's I okay. Hey, I'll, it's, it's, inter- <laughs> it's internet. I don't care. <laughs> Say whatever you want. Yeah, Free speech. Yeah, so, I, so I, you know, there's 40, 50 people on set, and I figure, okay, Paris, you want to do this? Back your ears, do it, you know? Uh-huh. So I did, and I uh, had a blast, I mean, making this movie, and got back to Texas, and within about six months, I uh, I got a call that Anchor Bay had picked up the film for release, and they were going to premiere it at Mans in Hollywood. Huh. Bill Grom and you know, and I'm, of course at that point, man, I'm I'm <laughs> super excited. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, and anything and, and, and total disbelief, by the way, because uh-huh. you know, I mean, I I was thrilled to get the part in the film, you know, I was thrilled to be in, but I thought, you know, what I'm saying, I, I was just hoping it would get the DVD and you know whatever. And Anchor Bay was, you know, that, that was already a, a pretty well established name, you uh-huh. know, and uh. Well, anyway, so got to do the the premiere at Man's and walk across those footprints, and you know that night I, I thought, you know, nothing else good ever happened to me. My wife, <laughs> I, told, I told my wife, if anything else good ever happens, you know, I, I felt blessed. Okay, and I mean that. Oh yeah. To this day, and uh, so I got to that, I started being offered all these bad guy roles <laughs> in in horror films, and it, it was like playing villains, and uh, it's still still working in these films and having a blast doing so I am pushing to play other kind of roles now still within the horror genre because I love this but I also you know I love playing the villains but I also want to play those guys maybe are not necessarily always the villains oh sure you know yeah and there's because there's plenty of complexities and <laughs> contrast and colors and hues to those characters as well and uh, just did a film called In a Madman's World which is a uh, a true crime thriller uh, based on, based on the uh, the Houston serial murders that occurred back in the early seventies, uh, literally a very dark period of time for, for Houston. Uh, Wayne Henley and Dean Coral were two guys that uh, they abducted and killed many children. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And. Uh, I was contacted by the director, and the director wanted... He offered me the role of uh, Wayne's father, Elmer, who... Elmer was a son of a bitch, and, uh, (laughs) you know, I looked upon Elmer as, you know... It's kind of like, you know, the movie Frankenstein, the old story, you know, you had Dr. Frankenstein who created the monster, okay? Elmer was such a bad father, such a horrific demon of a father, I viewed him as a catalyst for what his son Wayne went on to become, which was a killer. And so I played him that way. But anyway, got to do that film with someone that I've called friend for a while, but someone who's worked, God, I've grown up 
being a Texan, watching and admiring, and that's that, that Marilyn Burns. Uh, Marilyn played Sally Hardesty in Chainsaw, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original. Oh, and, okay. uh, so working with her, her already being a friend and somebody whose work I looked up to was, was a pretty awesome thing. And uh, the director, Josh Vargas, he was awesome to work for. And like I said, I just feel like a, a lucky SOB. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. who, who knew? You know, here's the thing, you know, three, three and a half years, I'll be honest. It's only been the last three and a half years I've been able to call acting my full-time job. Uh-huh. You know, did a lot of films leading up to to the last three and a half years. And I kept my day job too. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, I, it was I, I, you know, listen. I would do it. I would go back if I had to go back. You know, right now the acting pays the bills, and I'm thankful. Oh, but hell, good. I'd still act even if I had to go back and get another day job at some point. Cause <laughs> it, it's in your blood. It's in your blood. Now, oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. And, and you know, and there's always something special. Uh, I, it took me a long time to figure out because I never used to be into horror. I mean, back in the day when I was a little kid, I used to thought, who wants to watch a horror movie? Who wants to watch somebody get their head chopped off? I mean, because I thought, you know, because I didn't know the process of how a movie was made, I thought if somebody was getting their head chopped off, that that's actually real. Oh and You know, and I thought, oh, who wants to watch that? So I was turned off by horror for a long, long time until I started doing my YouTube stuff and then realized that there's a big, big community of horror fans out there that love the stuff, and it got me kind of thinking, it's like, you know, maybe I got ought to give it another shot, because now that I know I'm older and I know how movies are made, uh, and I don't get scared anymore like I used to right, back in the right. day, <laughs> why don't I just give it another shot? And, and you know what? I actually... I actually you know, I just, became a, yeah, I became kind of a fan. I'm not a hor- I'm not a huge fan. Like I don't have like right. you know a whole collection of horror films or whatever. But I I have a few, but only just a few of my favorites, like the Halloweens and the Freddies and the, and the Jasons and all that stuff on Blu-ray oh, yeah. and all that. But I started to love it, and and then that's why I thought, well, you know, I gotta I gotta talk to Paris here because he he's like I think I've I've chatted with a couple other people who have done horror movies before. I I believe I I chatted with Alex Vincent who. Uh, played uh, the role of Andy Barker in uh, Child's Play 1 and 2. But, right, right, but other right. than that, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I ever have had the chance to actually chat with anybody else that was in the horror genre besides yourself. So, it's interesting to learn about that. Well, I think the horror genre is, uh, you know, A, you're right. I mean, the fans of the genre are global. I mean, you know, and, and I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The fans of horror cinema, they are the most loyal, coolest group of people you're ever going to meet. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate, I, I, fortunate now to, uh, to to get invited to various horror conventions where I get to meet a lot of people who who support the genre, you know? And they come up and they, they say such super kind, wonderful things that are, you know, literally so humbling. I mean that. Sincerely, and you know, and I'm thinking, wow! I worked many years in corporate America, and nobody ever came up and said thank you or we appreciate your work. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? Okay. No okay. No and uh, it's a pretty, pretty cool thing, and and we're very lucky to get to do this. And I say always, I work for those people who support the genre. You, you know, on the set, you're working for the director, but uh, overall, in the grand scheme of things, I work for those people who support the horror film genre. Now, that's not saying that I, as well, you know, there are other genres of film that I, I love, you know, I mean, I work in horror, but I also, I grew up, man, studying and loving, you know, all kinds of, of if you will, film genres. I love the classics. I love the film noir era of the 40s, okay? Uh-huh. I go back and watch the classics. Uh, oh, sure. I love yeah. films like uh, Orson Welles, Okay. I love films like hell, for that matter, Mildred Pierce, even though film noir classic with uh, 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 Joan Crawford, for example. Um, great classics with Jimmy Cagney, you know, uh, gosh, Jimmy Stewart, so many others, all the way through the 50s. I love dramas. I love human dramas. <laughs> and I think that's one of the cool things about those dramas made in the 40s and the 50s. Those that dealt strictly, they were character character stories and they dealt strictly with the basic human conflicts you know whether it be 
somebody lost their job and you're about to lose a house. They dealt with adultery. They dealt with crying, you know. Uh-huh. Um, and these are the things that, no matter the decade, no matter the generation, never change, you know. So you can watch one of them. watch a movie made in 1950 a film that deals with basic human conflicts and you can still relate to them because uh-huh. as human beings we still face the same conflicts all these years later yeah. I think that's the magic of cinema these things given that you've got to deal with good performances films live on forever your performances in those films still can wow entertain and uh, like I said these are films that I'm talking about now made it's so have so, so have you uh, yeah so have you ever had a chance to work with I guess I I guess I also had a chance to interview like Michael Berryman and Dick and Lance Warlock who were also in the original Halloween two movie have you ever had a chance to work right. with any of those guys at all like do you know do you know honestly uh, almost uh, Michael and I were attached to a project that unfortunately the, the folks that were you know putting project together it, it hasn't come to fruition yet uh, I've done conventions, appeared at conventions with, gosh, I, I found myself sitting across from Michael Berman, for example, or, or sitting across from John Carpenter, even. Uh, yeah. Ernest Borgnine, believe it or not, a couple of years ago, I did a convention, and Ernest Borgnine is sitting across, I'm at one table, he's at another, and in between, you know, when we get a break, I went over and talked to Ernest, and this is before he passed away, yeah. you know, unfortunately we lost him recently, but Ernest gave me his phone number because we, we we talk we talk about film and I'm a huge huge admirer of this work or I still am he's gone now but again the work lives on but I, I remember telling him how much his work had meant to me and we talked and the guy was so great I called him Mister Borgnine and he said no you you have to call me Ernie call, Ernie. <laughs> oh, I call you Ernie yeah I know I'm, I was raised in Texas so you, it's Mister yeah you know Borgnine but he gave me his phone number and we had a few really cool subsequent chats after that and one of the greatest guys that you could have ever wanted to have met but uh listen I sat across from Adrian Borlo again people like that that uh, I had to you know kind of like thump myself and say wow who'd have thunk it right <laughs> yeah. uh, I did just do a film the film I was talking about earlier really, that just got released called Jacob uh did that film with Michael Bean okay uh and oh, nice. uh Jimmy Hampton and they were awesome to work with, by the way. Uh, working with Michael was a really cool experience. Because, again, in the 80s, I grew up, you know, seeing him in Terminator. Sure, yeah. So many other cool films. Kyle and, uh, Reese. So to get to, you know, <laughs> suddenly find myself acting with him was an awesome experience. Yeah. Okay? And uh, had a, had one scene where we had a tremendous bar fight. So, <laughs> we, you know, it's always, those are the days that are fun, man. When, when, when you know. When you get to do this physical, and of course you've always got the directors and and or the director and the producers, they're concerned about you know you doing your stunts. You know what I'm saying? Um, they bring in the fight choreographer and different things, but then they'll yeah. You know, there's a scene where if they you're gonna go over a table, they they tend to want to bring in a stunt person to do that for you. You know? Yeah. And I kind of tend to want to do that myself because I say shit looks fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And too, I mean, it, yeah, and it's like I learned to a building, but oh, you know, sure. let me do some of the stuff. And uh, and Michael was the same way, so it was a really cool deal. We had a good time. And, and, and that's just the thing too. It's like when you talk about working for corporate America, it's almost like how I feel about the last few jobs that I've had. You know, it's like you know, I want to do I want to do something with entertainment myself. You know, and that's why I do interviews, and that's why I do radio and, and the, the things that I do. But it's all volunteer. I don't get paid for it. You know, unfortunately, it's just you know, it's for the love of the work. But it's like when I work for some, but when I work for somebody who's paying me like at a job that I don't enjoy, like you know, just a regular nine to five job or whatever. Uh, it's like you know, you're working your ass ass off pretty much to make that person rich, while you're not even making anything, and and you're and they're, they expect so much out of you. But then when you're an actor, and you're working with people that you grew up idolizing. You know, it makes it makes the job. I'm sure for you, so excited that you like a little kid at Christmas time. <laughs> you got it. You know, I mean, it's it's uh, number one for for me having grown up wanting to do this my whole life and, and waiting until later life to do it. You know, listen, I just feel really lucky. A that I I've, I've been given the chance to do it. Okay, and then you know, even I don't know more so, man. 
get to a point where I'm working opposite people that yes, I grew up watching the local cinema, and it's it's a uh, it's both a daunting experience. And that, you know, yeah, you're a little bit nervous because, I mean, you're working with somebody who's been in the business for 25, 30 years or whatever, uh-huh. you know? Uh-huh. And, and and so at that point as an actor, you you, you, you want to be your best, okay? so you, But that's good because then you're challenging yourself to be better, to work harder, you know? And uh, and I'm my own worst critic, so I always, <laughs> no matter what, I, I always feel, damn, got to do this better, got to work harder. You know, I'm kind of obsessive about it. My wife... When I have any character in any film, I, you know, listen, I create the whole backstory. I'm one of those. I, I did the backstory. I create it. I live it. I breathe it at home, you know, many, many weeks before the actual production. And, you know, like right now, having kind of like three productions staggered really in front of me, I, I, my wife said it, it's like living with a schizophrenic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on three different characters, and each one of them has their own separate little story, Okay. In as far as backstory, yeah, because that helps you as the actor get that on the camera. The audience will never see that backstory. It helps me when I create that whole history. He's oh. I can become him, you know, and yeah. uh, and I think whether it's a B movie or an A list, if you're going to be an actor, do your best. Really, really work on it and be obsessive about it. Go out there and. You listen, nothing says that you can't always try to give, and I'm not saying I do. I'm saying, though, this should be the goal. Try to give an A-list performance, even if it's in a B film. Oh, yeah. Because the, the, the people who buy that film or rent that film or download that film to, to watch, they're spending money. They, they deserve a good film and a good performance or the best you can give. You know what I'm saying? So how would you... And, uh, so how would you... Yeah. Uh, how would you rate yourself then as an actor on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 being the best. Oh, man. See, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> here's the thing. Well, honestly, you know, it, if it's something, you know, as an actor, you just, uh, at least for me, I'm going to say, man, uh, <laughs> Put you on the spot. You, wanna, you don't want to say, it's never, even, I'm not comfortable with ever saying, well, I think I'm, I did well. <laughs> Yeah. I, I just can't do that because it's not I don't know I can tell other people they're great yeah. you know but I can't I don't know you know now I'll be the first to say I'll pick out my flaws I can verbalize those I can say shit let it be longer or, you know um, I should have bought this nuance and I didn't there are times yes when I watch certain things and I think that was okay but I can't talk about those I, I even to my wife <laughs> <laughs> you know but I can tell you all about, you know, when I think I just should have done better. But I will say this. I compare what I do now in the films of the last, like, three, four years, okay? Yeah. To those first principal roles I had, you know. And I, and I do feel that I've improved, okay? And there are roles and performances in films that I've given in the last, like I said, three years that, I can sit and I can watch and, and not cringe at this. Because, you know, when I say cringe, it was ironic. You know, even those earlier films, my wife would say, I would sit there and cringe. I would tear myself apart watching myself on the screen. While other people would be watching and enjoying it and not noticing any of the things that I was noticing. Uh-huh. My wife would tell me that. You know, you know, why are you so hard on yourself? It's just who I am. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know. I think most actors are, are the same way. You know, I think if you can watch yourself, if you're one of those people who can watch yourself and tell yourself that you're good, there's something wrong with you. you know? <laughs> well, you know, you, there's a lot of these A-list uh, actors and celebrities. You know, not they're not all like this, but they, you know, they they sh- they think their shit don't stink more or less. They think they're better than everybody because yeah, they got a lot of yeah. money and everything. But I like people like like yourself who are you know, who's like a down to earth person. You know, and I and and pretty much a lot of people that I've chatted with uh, in my you know the, in, with the interviews I've done have been down to earth. Uh, I just don't like people that are think that they're better than everybody else just because they got lots of money and everything. And even if they've been in the business for thirty years, and yeah, show respect to them, but you know they should be still down to earth people. You know, and, you know you got it. You know I'll tell you something. I'll, I'll share with you something Ernest Borgnine said to me. He, uh, you know, he asked me. He said, 
well, have I seen any of the films that you've done? And I, you know, I kind of, you know, shook my head. I said, well, Mr. Borgnine, I said, you know, I doubt that. I said, I haven't done the caliber of work that you've done. You know, because Ernest Borgnine, let's face it, I mean, you know, whether you're talking the Besides Adventure or those films that he did in the, in the 70s or whether you go back to Marty, the film in the 50s, uh -huh. and, you know, which won the Academy Award, you know, this is Ernest Borgnine, but you know what that guy said to me? This guy who's a legend and is a legend, you know, beyond his passing still. He said, he slapped me on the back, he laughed that laugh that only Ernest Borgnine had, and he said, he said, bullshit. He said, you're an actor, aren't you? I said, well, yes, sir. And he said, you're getting paid to act, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, then you're the thing I am. And that's what he said, and you know that meant a lot to me. Oh, okay? Wow. That was everybody, no matter, I'm telling you, whether you're that A-lister making, you know, several millions of dollars, or whether you're the guy working on the B-films, making, you know, a reasonable day rate, and lucky enough to pay your bills, you should be thankful, be humble, and know that you're never better than, you know, the million-dollar actor is no better than the the guy who's, who's working maybe on, on the B-films. And that's what Ernest was conveying at that point. This is a guy who had... Uh, work with the greats like Spencer Tracy and so many others yet he was saying to me whether it's B-movies or A-list movies makes no difference yeah. if you're acting and you're getting paid and you're an actor you know and never never be ashamed of that so I don't know it meant a great deal to me you know. uh, so that's if there's one great thing that I can say that has come out of continuing to act and being lucky enough to do so, it's getting to meet so many cool people, whether it be working with them, like like Michael Bean or or Jimmy Hampton. Jimmy is a character actor, a great character actor, played in so many films, Teen Wolf being one oh, of yeah. the pop culture titles, played Michael J. Fox's father. Heck yeah. And the others, uh, whether it be Marilyn Burns and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, again, or saving at a convention and... Uh, Man, you're sitting down to, to eat dinner with, uh, I don't know, you know, whomever, okay? Uh, you know, you, you sit down and you're having having lunch or, or whatever with the cast of The Walking Dead because you're attending a convention and they're there too, okay? Uh, again, it's uh, Meg Foster, uh, I've been a good, Judy Gieson, some of these class actresses that are in Rob Zombie's Lord's Salem, I just did a convention with them, an awesome experience. Uh, that that part of it, getting to meet them, getting to sit down with them, I still have to like kind of kick myself, pinch myself, or whatever, because I, I I feel like wow, how lucky I am, and I realize that. But at the same time, I think, damn, Parrish, you 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 haven't even done enough to deserve to be here. <laughs> well, even though, yeah. and I've said that to a few other to these to some of these actors, and they always always say bullshit. You're working, you know, and you deserve to be here and very kind in that regard. I mean, man, these are people that I grew up watching. Okay? Yeah. And as a result, obviously, it's like, a, I'll say the five convention I did, I'm not getting you out. I'm sitting next to, right next to Muriel, Muriel Hemingway. Now, you know what I'm going to say when I say Muriel Hemingway? Yeah. The actress who played in the Star 80. Uh, yep. I know and, who that is. kind, warm, we talk in between, you know, the fans coming up and we're signing different things and she's just an awesome lady and again, that that's one more of those stories that I think, holy fuck, I'm sitting next to her. <laughs> 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 you know? Yeah, because she was also so, she was also like in uh, Delirious too, I believe, with John Candy, right? I think so. You know, yep. she, Meryl Hemingway, Star 80 and so many films, she was in the old uh, God, she was in the, as early back as I first thing I remember seeing her in with lipstick with oh. her sister Margot. Oh, her little sister Margot, um, yeah. and uh, that was a very disturbing, <laughs> violent film. But uh, bottom line, you know, Meryl's been around for a long time, you know, and uh, she's a gorgeous lady. Okay, and uh, I don't know; those are the things that I consider real perks. Oh, you know, that's cool. just getting to meet some of these people and. Uh, but more importantly than anything, getting to meet the people that support the films when they come up and say we like your work, and that is 
that's the ultimate honor, man. It really is. That's that's what it's about. You oh, know. Oh yeah. I definitely would. Uh, I definitely would agree with you. Uh, you know, that's just the thing too. That's what I like about films and stuff because I've, uh, you know, I watch my share of blockbusters. I'm sure they're great and everything. You know, sometimes I get a little sick of hearing the, about the same old movie all the time. And and I, I'm like, I'm uh, just like you. I'm trying to uh, try to be like uh, find the the underdog more or less. You know, of the actor. Like if you're watching an independent movie and and you you at first you don't think you're gonna like it, but then all of a sudden it blows you away. Or if you're watching even like a sitcom. And you you know you don't think you're gonna like it, but then something about it, you know, like I'm just I recently just uh, been watching a show that I bought on DVD called uh, Mike and Molly. It's on CBS. Yeah. And I never yeah. watched I never watched the show when it you know when it was on the TV, but I actually bought the D, the first season, and I love that show. It cracked me up, and I don't even know anything much about the actors besides the uh, the one girl she was on Bridesmaids and and the new movie Identity Thief that's coming out pretty soon. But you know, I didn't know how good this this show really was. So that's that's what it is. I mean, it's like you don't have to be a, a big name actor or, or actress to, to to do a good job in, in films. You just gotta know what you're doing. You know, <laughs> it's all about work. It's like it's you know, I, again, some of some of the people I've become friends with that you know, man, you know, we're trying to like find films that we can do together. Even you know. Uh, Brooke Lewis, uh, who is an actress, Ben and I murders different films, and uh, you know she's a gorgeous young lady. And uh, shout out to Brooke, by the way, if she hears this, she is a tour de force actress. Kelly Maroney, who played in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and you know, uh, gosh, uh, and she also was in Chopping Mall and so many great Jim Wynorski films. You know, it's, uh, literally, you know, we talk about you know the idea that B movies. As they were back in the 80s. B movies in the 80s were kind of considered B movies, but during the 80s, something changed, you know, with VHS, you know, because fans like myself, that I, I was, I was, you know, late teens, early 20s, we had the mom and pop video stores. Oh, okay? Yes. Now, now, Fast Times Original High was not a B movie. Let me figure out no. some things. There was <laughs> Shopping Mall. No. Yeah. Okay. Suddenly, you were able to seek out. You found these. It goes along with what you were saying. You would give a B movie a try, and it was good. And it offered you a different kind of entertainment. Uh-huh. Something that is a different is a different type of ninety minute thrill ride. Something you didn't see from the blockbusters. Okay. And so then you went back to the to the mom and pia store, and you would seek out other B movies. Okay. And so. I don't know, the 80s, the 80s was the dawning of, I think, from the beginning of people discovering, again, low-budget horror movies that were shot to go direct to, at that time, VHS, never played theaters, and a lot of people like myself said, hell, we can enjoy these as much, if not often more so, than those widescreen theatrical films. <laughs> and uh, and that, that whole movement has, has continued to grow. And now it's uh, kind of a, a massive global following that these films have. And uh, I'm just glad to be a part of the creation of a few of those films. Oh, really, sure. I am. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and, and that's... It's, it's, yeah. uh, Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say okay. it's, a, uh, it's a cool time in which we live, you know. Yep. I mean, I find, find myself... Uh, Telling my lucky stars, thanking my lucky stars, or whatever you want to say, every day, you know. Well, <laughs> no, I, I I agree with you on, on the the whole mom and pop stores thing because you know it's sad to see like blockbusters and all that and Hollywood videos you know started to to disappear as well because of Netflix and Redbox and all that stuff. But but the like, even like I'm, I'm from a small town uh, called Greenbush, Minnesota, up in you know, northern Minnesota, so it's real close to Canada, yeah. and. Uh, we used to have a few well, mom hey, and pop Ke- stores. Kelly Kelly Maroney is from your your state. Kelly Maroney. Okay. okay. Yeah, Kelly. Kelly. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, I that's okay. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. But I, I was going to say, you know, I just kind of, I kind of missed the days of the mom and pop uh, video stores because it was always so interesting when you go into a, a video store, you know, with a cool little title, whatever they, whatever, whatever they wanted to call it. Uh, and just go and see, you know, some actors that you wouldn't probably ever think could act really good. Like I, I mean, I have a list of people that I I consider 
great actors, and, and some of them are like Kieran Culkin, Macaulay Culkin's younger brother, uh, who right, has done a bunch right, of right. independent films. Uh, I'm a big fan of Michael Pere from the Eddie and the Cruisers. You know when he right. he was Eddie Wilson, right. and he's done a lot of different films and all that that weren't that weren't oh, yeah. like big blockbusters like after the whole Eddie and Cruisers thing, but still continue to do film just like you are, and and, and the list goes on and on and on about people that I've seen, whether it's two independent films or, or films that we used to rent from the bottom pop stores, that blew me away, and I, I, I wish that these people were either still acting or, or, or you know, would find out where they are. Like, uh, there's a guy who was in Weird Science, uh, not Anthony Michael Hall, but the guy who played opposite of him, uh, Elon Mitchell Smith, who played uh, Wyatt. Right, right. And he's a school teacher now, you know, for a college. Wow. So... Wow. <laughs> you know, I've met Anthony Michael Hall at a couple of events, and he's a really cool guy. I've met the, the other guy, and that's why he's a school teacher now. Wow, so you never know. <laughs> you know, people that we saw in films 20, 30 years ago, they've gone on to have, in many cases, careers outside the business, uh-huh. you know. Uh, and a lot of them left the business, maybe because, you know, uh, it just wasn't, you know, literally. I mean, and I do know a couple of people who... They didn't leave the business because the roles weren't still there. They just, it wasn't what they wanted. You know, they discovered it wasn't necessarily. I think a lot of people, and you know, one comes to mind that I won't say her name. She left the business. She had done a string of really successful films, and she just left. And she told me once that she left because because she loved the she loved the whole artistic aspect of creating characters. But she didn't like the type of roles that she was, unfortunately, just being pigeonholed into. Uh, and so she finally said, okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. And she walked away and left Hollywood and went back. I won't say to which state, but uh, she went back and uh, and she now is actually a high school principal. Oh, you know? wow. and, and I often wonder if any of, her, any of the kids in her high school will go back and find any of her own movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go back and find some pretty radical films. <laughs> <I can see. laughs> yeah, because even uh, even Elon Mitchell Smith, who's a, a teacher, you know, he he kind of got away from that too after doing uh, I think his last movie or last sh- show that he did was uh, the second season of Superboy. There's a show called Superboy yeah. way back in the eighties, and he was like the younger guy, whatever the muscular guy. Anyway, uh, after that, he went to school to be a teacher, and he's kind of the, t- the type of guy who, he wants to kind of forget about th- the stuff that he did back in the 80s, and, and I don't understand why, I, I think if you, if you, uh, I think you should be proud of what you accomplished even at a young age, even if it wasn't your niche, because he's the type of guy now who just, you know, he, you know, I tried to, f- to do an interview with him, and he, he kind of refused because he, he didn't want to talk about weird science, or he didn't want to talk about the wildlife, wow. or he didn't want to talk about, you know, any of the films that he did, and and it's kind of sad because it's like uh, I can understand, you know, weird science. You know, it's you hear about it all the time, over and over it's again. It's a cult. It's a, it's 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 a cult class. Yeah, I mean, you know, and uh, but he just it had a it, yeah he huge just audience. Yeah, he just did like to. He just doesn't want to talk about it anymore. He wants to just move on and forget about it. <laughs> right, right, and and you know, I mean, certainly that's everybody's you know choice, et cetera. But for me personally, I you know I don't know I, I can't. I can't, for myself, I, that's not me, you know? Yeah. I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for every role and every film I've done. And, you know, believe me, out of 19, 20 films that I've done 20 thus far, dude, I, you know, listen, there's been a few that were stinkers, okay? Yeah. I mean, ultra, ultra lows. That, and as the actor, you don't, see, you don't always have control of them. You know, you, <laughs> you show up prepared, you show up ready, and, well, you know, maybe... Maybe on occasion the uh, production team did not as much as what you. I don't know. You know what I'm saying. What yeah. You know, okay. For and it's just, but you still that doesn't matter. You show up and you do your job. Yeah. And, but you know what? I don't regret those 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 two or three stinkers in there. I don't regret those because those people thought enough cast me and to pay me. And you know, listen. I don't. There's not a film I've done that I'm uh, that I, I, I I regret doing. You know, there there are those that turned out better than others, uh-huh. but uh, they're all part of the growing experience. And the, hell, I've had fun. 
with every show. I mean, it's a lot of hard work. You've got to love it enough. You get the passion has to be so that you love it so much that when you're working 16 hours a day, because these, understand, when you're making movies, these movies, the movies, for example, you know, there's a lot of movies involved. Yeah. Um, so you can work literally 16 hours a day. And you've got to love it so much that you know, during the 16th hour, you're as up and excited as you were during the first or second hour. <laughs> because you get this whole, man, having a good time. You're acting. You're you're getting paid to do what you love to do. Yeah. Okay? That's for sure. Well, and I, that's I, what it's about. Yeah. And, you know, I tell you what, I, I just want to say thank you for just uh, being a, a guest on the show. And we, we've we gone longer than I wanted to go, but that's okay. I mean, oh. you know, it doesn't matter. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not yeah. set <laughs> press for time. <laughs> But, well, I told you I tend to uh, talk. To uh, talk. You get into talking about film, I will talk about film. <laughs> you know? And that's cool. I, I, I like that. You know, I like when I can meet somebody. You know, even just talk on the telephone, we can talk about something that we all have that we all love in common. Because I, I will always be a film nut. You know, I don't have to buy every movie on DVD or Blu-ray to prove that. I just know that because of the stuff that I love growing up and, and the stuff that I love now. You know, things change here and there, but I will always be a movie fan no matter what. And that's just exactly. that's just what it yeah, is. Me too. So I want to say thank you, Paris. Uh, uh, is there anything you want to say to your fans at all before we take off? Yeah, actually, I do. I just I just want to thank everybody for for the kind kind support uh, for enabling me to do this thing that I do, and uh, because it's those people who support me. And, and I, you know, listen, I have a hard time saying fans, so I, I call them friends and supporters. They support the films. They support me in what I do, and I work. Because guess what? That they've given me my dream. They've given me the dream of being able to to, to, to act and call it a job. And uh, so that's it. Just thank you and God bless for allowing me that. You know. Oh yeah. Those folks. No problem. And thanks again for being a part of the Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture series and. You know what? I, I consider you an icon. Even if it's in pop culture or whatever, you're doing what you want, and who knows, maybe one day we'll see you in the next big blockbuster. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll be the guy in the blockbuster who, who feels like, you know, I, I don't need a trailer, just give me a tip. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever get there. So I don't spend the money on the trailer, put that in the movie, just give me a tip. <laughs> there you go, there you go. All right, man, well, All you right. have a good night, and uh, once again, thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk to you later. All right. right, you have a great one, my All friend. Right, Thank you, Rand. And that was Parrish Randall, an uh, actor who's an up and coming actor who has been do- in the film business for a little while. And uh, I'll put down his Facebook page and his website as well, like I always do for every guest that I have. So, uh, once again, thank you for uh, participating in the Frankie Slauson Show and uh, my Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture series as we search around this summer for uh, many, many different people that I have selected or that I've been trying to find to do interviews with. we got some very big guests that uh, that will be coming. I'm not going to name any names right now because by this time, the time that this goes up, I have probably already done a few more interviews with a few more big guests. Uh, and, and who knows? I'm pretty sure by that time, by the time this goes up, which would be like the third week of June, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure by that time I, I've i already done some big interviews already. So, anyway, Frank Slauson, and uh, let me know who else you would like me to try to find. Uh, you know, if, if there's certain icons of pop culture that you feel would be cool to have on the show, and don't put down Justin Bieber or anything like that or Bruce Willis because you got to be a little bit reasonable. These people, they have to be people that you're able to communicate with, first of all, and people that you know that would be easy for me to find, not people that uh, are, are, you know, like Steven Spielberg, who I would love to interview, who definitely would be uh, an icon of pop culture, but somebody that, uh, you know, that maybe was like a big name back in the day that, you know, isn't really doing much at all lately. You know what I mean. If you've watched, if you've followed my interviews enough, you know the format of what I'm looking for. So if you can help me out, I appreciate it. And uh, other than that, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.